Hi, Gabe. No ears. Hey, Professor. Hi, Gabe. Hey, Professor. How are you? I'm doing fine. Just need a little help. Uh, tell me where we were. Did we get we, through five things around the center item? We were doing the charges. How to determine the charges? I only got through formal charges, huh? And then I know I think you did some of the shapes. No, you did this. You did the angles. I did. No, no. Okay. What was the last? What's the last thing in your notes? Last thing in my notes are the charges. <laughs> okay, but I did the shapes after that. Yeah, you did. No, I remember going over. I was just focusing on the charges. Okay. Uh, did I? Do you remember my going through the uh, four things? Did I get through? Four things around the center atom. I don't think so. Okay. All right. I did get through electron uh, clouds. So, hi, Jasmina. Hi, Professor. How are you? I'm doing fine. We may, Jasmina, we may go through a little bit of review first, then we're going to get on. I know I got into the shapes, Gabe. I know I did get into the shapes. Yeah, you did get in the shapes. All right. I just can't remember how far into the shapes you got. No problem. We'll get, we're going to get as far as we get. And sorry about the lighting. My lamp bulb just, just uh, blew out on me. All right. Oh. Okay. I got through electron clouds, didn't I, Gabe? Yeah. Yes, you did. Uh, maybe Kevin can help us here in a second. So basically, an electron cloud is any lone pair or any bonding pair of electrons. A single, double, or triple bond counts as one electron cloud. Each lone pair counts as one electron cloud. So what that does is if you count the number of things around the center atom, that sets the overall geometry of the molecule, or what I call the electron geometry. Does that make sense to you, Gabe? Yes. All right, let me just see if Kevin, Kevin, you out there? Need some help here for a second, Kevin. Hello. Hi. How far did we get? Did we get through tetrahedrons? Um, I, uh, I don't recall. Okay. Well, I don't think. I think. I don't remember. Do you remember me talking about electron clouds, though? No, I don't really remember that. Okay. You remember me talking about how the electrons push away from one another? Yeah. All right. All right. At least we have a basis of starting. Okay. The electrons want to get as far away from one another as possible. So electron clouds form different geometries to do this. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So if I've got two electron clouds around the center atom, they want to get as far apart from one another so they're going to be linear from one another. In other words, I can't get any further away than 180. If this one goes down a little bit, this is going to repel it back up. If it goes up, it's going to repel it back down. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I have three things around the center atom, then the best geometry, the best geometry I can come up with is something called trigonal planar. So. Let me see if I can, if I've got another, I think I have a picture here. Yes. So if I have three things around, look, look at this linear one, okay? Say I have an, another atom coming in at this center atom. Well, if I have another atom coming in here, that's gonna push away both of these. And since these don't have, have as much push against one another, because they're 180 degrees apart from one another. When I add another one, it pushes these guys down so that I have equal angles around my center atom. Equal angles are going to be 120 degrees. All right. Now, if I shove a, if I go from like outside and shove it right at that blue ball in the center for 120, what the new atom is going to do is it's going to push the other three down. When it pushes the other three down, it does so in an equal, equal angles. And that ends up being something called a tetrahedron shape. 
Now, if I have another one coming from the bottom up here, that's gonna force these three back up into a plane. When it forces those three back up into a plane, I have what's known as a trigonal bipyramid. I then put another atom coming in at that center one, pushes everything as far away as it can. That's an octahedron. The bond angles are 90 degrees. Is this making sense to you? Yeah, yes. they just want to be as far apart as possible. Mm -hmm. Ian, where, how far did I get, Ian? Ian, do, are you out there, Ian? Okay, yes, no matter. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Being difficult. Do you remember how far we got? Did we get to tetrahedron? Uh, I think so. Okay. No matter, we'll just continue on from here. Okay, now, if I have that extra thing coming at the center atom being a lone pair, it acts with greater force than the, than the bonding pairs do. So if I have an extra thing up here, it pushes down with greater force than these two push away from each other. So my electronic geometry is still gonna be trigonal planar, but I can't see those. I can't see that lone pair. So all I'm seeing are these three atoms, which means that my shape is going to be bent. Two slides you're gonna need. You're gonna need the electron, the overall electron cloud geometry slide, and you're gonna need this series of slides that's coming up. Okay. Understand this. If there are no lone pairs around the center atom, then the electronic geometry is the same as the molecular geometry. It's only when there are lone pairs that the shape gets kind of funky. So if I have three domains around my center atom and one of them is a lone pair, I have a bent molecule. If I have four things around, one's a lone pair, I have a trigonal pyramid. Four things around it, two lone pairs, I have bent because all I'm seeing are the three atoms. I'm not seeing the lone pairs. I'm gonna go through these in individual, in a little bit more individual order in a second. Okay. If I have five clouds around it, and one's a lone pair, I get what's known as a seesaw shape. Five things, two lone pairs, T shape. Five things around the center atom, if three are lone pairs, it's linear. Six things around the center atom, one lone pair, square pyramidal. Six things, two lone pairs, square planar. So bottom line, what you have to do, what you have to do is you have to draw the Lewis dot structure first to do Vesper. You need to draw the Lewis dot structure first because you got to see how many clouds are around the center atom and how many of those clouds are lone pairs. Count the number of electron clouds around the center atom. That dictates the overall shape. Then you determine how many lone pairs are around the center atom. And from that, that will dictate the molecular shape. Two domains. I have two domains around the center atom that you want to get as far apart as possible, 180 degrees apart from one another. It doesn't matter if one of these happens to be a lone pair, like in the case of cyanide ion, you just have two atoms. It's still going to be linear, no matter what. That's the only one in which the, if you add an electron pair, the shape remains the same. So if I have two things around the center atom, my electron geometry is going to be linear and my molecular geometry is going to be linear. I throw a third thing around that center atom. 
I put a third cloud around there. That dictates that my electronic geometry is going to be trigonal planar because this is as far as they can get apart from one another. If they're all bonding, then my molecular shape is trigonal planar. If I have one lone pair, that means I'm not seeing one of the red balls up there anymore. And all I'm seeing is the red ball to the gray to the red ball, which is angular or bent. So to summarize this, if I have three domains around the center atom, none are lone pair, I'm gonna have trigonal planar. If I have three things around the center atom, two are bonding, one is a lone pair, then I'm going to be bent. Remember, remember, lone pairs occupy more space than bondings do. If they occupy more space, then they push down more. So if they're pushing down more, this is going to decrease the bond angle. Guys, stop me if, if some of this is not making sense. I'm just continuing to go through because I need to get through some material today. So overall, the, the electron geometry is trigonal planar. Molecular shape is going to be bent. If I add another thing around there, I've got four electron clouds. That dictates I have this geometry, which is called a tetrahedron. I got one going straight up, pushing the other three down a little bit. Bond angles are 109.5. If I take one of these away, then all I'm seeing are the bottom four atoms, which means if I'm looking at that, I have three triangles that are put together. That looks like a triangle pyramid. So if I have four things around, understand the electronic geometry around the trigonal pyramid molecular shape is still the same. They're both tetrahedron. It's just that I can't see, I can't see this ball. So all I'm seeing are these four atoms down below it, which means that it's going to be a trigonal pyramid shape. Trigonal pyramid, four electron clouds, three are bonding, one lone pair. That lone pair pushes the other three down. So my bond angle decreases from 109.5 to around 107. What happens if I take another one away? And what shape do I get if I take another little ball away? Bent. I'm going to be bent because all I'm gonna see are two of the white balls and one of the blue ball in there. And that's gonna give me a bent shape. There's still, the bonds are forced because there are two lone pairs out there. Those bonds are gonna be even tighter so I'm gonna get about 104 degrees for a tetrahedron electronic shape, but a bent molecule. Okay. Uh, Kevin. Yeah. I have two bent shapes, right? One comes from the trigonal planar, one comes from the tetrahedron. Which one has the smaller bond angle or larger bond, larger bond angle? Um, Two things I um, want you to think about. I want you to think about the number of lone pair electrons on each and what the effect of lone pair electrons are. That's one thing. And the second thing, what shape did you start off with? So the larger would be the trigonal, trigonal planar. Absolutely. Trigonal pyramid or trigonal planar. You're starting off with a larger bond angle to begin with. Okay. And you only have one lone pair up here. Tetrahedron, the bond angle is smaller to begin with. And you have two lone pairs. 
which forces it even closer. So this is gonna be about 117 degrees. This is gonna be about 104. So to summarize, four domains, if there are all non, if there are no lone pairs around the center atom, again, electron domain is going to be the same as the molecular. They're both going to be tetrahedron. If I have one lone pair, I'm going to turn my electronic geometry into a trigonal planar. Two lone pairs, I'm going to turn my tetrahedron into a bent. Another effect that happens when you have bond angles, if you have a double or triple bond, what that does is that forces, you've got a greater density of electrons around here than you do around here and around here. So it, there's more force going down than there is between these two. So it pushes, in this case, the two chlorines closer together. Okay, Kevin, draw yes. H2S. Jessica, CO2. Uh, Jasmina, PCL3. And Ian, SO, uh, SO2. And Gabe, CH4. I need you to draw those and determine the molecular geometry. I give you about two minutes on that. Okay, how are we doing, guys? Anybody have an answer for me? Yeah, I do. No. Okay, uh, was it Ian first? Sure. Which uh, one do you have? SO2, it's bent. Bent. What's well, the electronic shape? Uh, shoot, what would it be? Uh, Look at your Lewis dot structure. Right. How many things are on the center atom? Two. No. So one there. One. No. Oh, wait. Two atoms around the S. And? Then the two on top of the S. You have, you have one lone pair and two bonding sets of electrons. One's a single, one's a double pair, trigonal planar. Correct. Who else said they were done? I did. Uh, who's I? Uh, uh, Gabriel. Gabriel, what do you got? Do you have CH4? Uh, yeah. Is it tetrahedral? Tetrahedron, yep. Tetrahedral. And well, is that both molecular and electronic? Yes. Okay. Jasmina. Jasmina? Yeah, hi. I hi. had PCL3. And yep. I got a tetrahedral and trigonal planar. There are, there is a lone pair around the P plus the three bonds to chlorine, tetrahedron, electronic, trigonal pyramid for the molecular. Uh, I've got Jessica or Kevin. 
Well, I got a linear. H2S, Kevin? Yeah. Okay, Kevin. When you drew your Lewis dot structure, you had six around sulfur, or six valence electrons for sulfur, two for the hydrogens, right? Yeah. All right, so if you have eight electrons, put the sulfur in the center and the two hydrogens behind to either side of it, right? Yeah. Okay, so you have one bond between one of the H's and the S and one between the other. You have four electrons left. Where do they go, Kevin? On the sulfur. On the sulfur. So how many clouds are around sulfur? Four. Four. Four electron clouds dictate what shape? Oh, the tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. But can I see those two lone pairs? No. So what's the shape? Bent. Bent. And Jessica, did I give you, give you CO2? Yes. And what's the shape? I don't know what's going on, I'm gonna be honest. I missed the last class and I don't know what chart you guys are looking off of. Jessica, I'm sorry, but you got it. If, if you miss a class, you gotta make it up with those videos. Yeah. Because you are going to be lost on this. <laughs> Do you know how to draw the Lewis dot structure of CO2? Yes. Okay. What did you come up with for CO2? Uh, oxygen with four electrons and then the two lines with carbon in the middle and then two lines and the oxygen with four electrons. Okay, so you got it, you got it drawn correctly. All right. Now, what you're looking at is looking at electron clouds or electron clouds, which are either lone pairs. Each lone pair counts as one electron cloud. All right, Jessica? Okay. So if each, each electron cloud contains a lone pair, are there any lone pairs around carbon? No. No. All right. Now, each double, single, or triple bond counts as one electron cloud. So how many double bonds do you have around carbon? Four. No. Remember, a double bond counts as one electron cloud. How many double bonds do you have, Jessica? Well, I have two. I have two on each side of carbon. No, you have two double bonds mm. on each side of carbon. I'm sorry. You have one double bond on each side of carbon, which adds up to two double bonds, right? Okay. So since double, triple, or single bonds count as one electron cloud, you have two electron clouds around that carbon, correct? Yes. So two electron clouds. Look at the chart. You got to pay attention to this chart. Two electron clouds. And I'm going to get up there in a second. Two electron clouds. What is the electron geometry? Linear. Linear. Okay, are both of the things that are attached to the carbon, are they atoms? Yes. So electronic molecular geometry is the same. So what is the molecular geometry around CO2? I don't know. Jessica, I just said, okay. I just said that if there are no lone pairs, electronic geometry is the same as the molecular geometry, right? Didn't I just say that? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Now, if electronic geometry is the same as the molecular geometry, if there are no lone pairs, and you just said the electronic geometry is linear, what's the molecular geometry? I'm not understanding this. I'm sorry, and I don't want to waste any more like class time. I'm really sorry, but I just, I don't, I'm not understanding. Stay with me after class, Jessica, okay? I have to go to work after class. All right, can you I'm get sorry. here? Can you get here early? Can you? I have a class, I have a trigonometry class right before this class. After, I'm talking five o'clock. Can you get be here at five o'clock? I work until seven. Uh, look at the, look at the uh, uh, videos. 
Organic okay. tutor. The organic tutor will help. Okay. Thank you. All right. If I have five things around it, five electron clouds around the center atom, I have trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. And basically the way these work, I've got a three atoms that are on the same on one plane. They are each 120 degrees away from one another. Then I have one shooting straight up, one shooting straight down. So if you look at the top side, that looks like a triangular pyramid. If you look at the bottom side, that looks like a triangle, triangular pyramid. There are two different bond angles. The ones that are on the uh, equator have bond angles of 120. The ones that are axial have nine, are 90 degrees away from the equatorial ones. All right, as I push, as I get a pair of lone pair that attacks the sulfur there, this pushes everything down. So this sulfur fluorine, sulfur fluorine bond angle is not no longer 180 degrees. It gets pushed down a little bit because of the lone pair, which also pushes these two closer together. So if I have five, if I have electron cloud of five around the center atom, I have four bonding, one lone pair. The shape I get is kind of a seesaw. If you can think of it as this thing is swinging around, you can see there's like a triangle here, not a triangle, but like a bent portion. That bent portion acts as, acts as a fulcrum of the seesaw. I shove another lone pair in here. I take one of these things away. I get something that looks like a T shape. So if I have five clouds around the center atom, trigonal by pyramid, I take two of them away and make lone pairs out of them. This gives me a T shape. I take another one away. This gives me a linear molecule. Now, I'll actually even give an extra credit point for this. What's the bond angle in this linear molecule? 180. Ian? No, that was Gabriel. Gabriel, sorry, kid. You got the point. Why is it 180, do you know? Because it's a straight line. Well, what, what happens with the, what happens, remember, I just told you up here, When I attack it with another lone pair, that pushes the bonds closer together. I'm trying to see if you're, th you're thinking here. You got the points, Ian. I'm just trying to see how much you're thinking about this. I don't know is a good answer, Ian. Yeah. Oh, this is Gabriel, by the oh, way. Gabriel, oh, Gabriel sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> sorry. That gives you four, Gabriel. You just equaled. Ian. Gabriel. Okay, yeah. rem do you remember where I said we're picking these electrons off of? Mm -hmm. Am I picking them off the equatorial? The equatorial ones, or am I picking them off the axis? Axial. You need off the equatorial, right? All right, so I've got three lone pairs around the equatorial, right? Mm-hmm. Aren't they using equal force on the top one and the bottom one? Yes. So basically all those electron uh, pairs are canceling out. Mm -hmm. So if I have a trigonal bipyramid, no lone pairs, I have a trigonal bipyramid molecular. One lone pair seesaw, two T-shaped, one linear. Questions, guys? Okay. I throw six clouds around there. This means I have an overall octahedron shape. All the angles are going to be 90 degrees. 
If I take away one of the atoms, and shove a lone pair in. Can anybody, can anybody see the electronic shape? Yeah, it's. Okay, do I have triangles here? Yes. How many of the triangles do I have? Mm, like four. So that's a square pyramid. I take another electron pair around it. See, I take one away, that looks like a square pyramid. I take another one away, this gives me square planar. All right. Bottom line, you can spend $300 on a molecular orbital kit. If you cannot see these things in your mind, you can spend $300 on a molecular orbital kit or $5 for a bag of marshmallows and a bag of pretzel sticks. If you're not being able to see the way these things look, I want you to buy the marshmallows and pretzel sticks and try and make these shapes and see what these shapes look like. So if I have an octahedron, no lone pairs, I have an octahedron molecular shape. One lone pair, square pyramidal, two lone pairs, square planar. Do I have any questions on this, guys? I need. I really need to know. Are you understanding this, or am I going too fast? I I'm understanding. Okay. Now, important point. You're going to run across other professors. I will try not to do this, but I may accidentally do it. I may draw, make you come up with. I may draw this molecule out and say, what's the shape of this? Your answer should be, I don't know. Which, which atom are you talking about, Mr. Popovich? Because the shapes for these three atoms are all different. Gabe. Yeah. How many clouds are around the left carbon? Mm, three. Mm, count again. Left two carbon, left carbon this one the one i'm circling yeah. how many electron clouds are around how many bonds do you have to that carbon three no how many lines are coming off this carbon oh four. Oh, i was only looking to the three hydrogen I said the left one gabe i said the left one so there are four yeah. we're in agreement okay, right, four. right. There are four we, here. yeah right. i thought the left was like the top hydrogen, the middle hydrogen, and the bottom. No, no, Le left C is what I said. Oh, okay. So yeah, four. Because it's uh, okay. three hydrogens and one carbon. So what is what is the shape of this? Uh, the, it's the tetrahedral. Tetrahedron. Yep. Okay. You answered the second one. How many clouds are around the middle car the carbon that's in the middle of this molecule? The three. Three. What does that yeah. dictate the shape to be? Uh, it's a, a pyramidal. No. Three electron, three electron clouds around the center atom. Is it like the planar one or? Which one? How much? What's what's the shape of the planar thing? Something goes in front of planar. Try triangular or trigonal. I don't know. Trigonal. Okay, I'm just like making up the random. Uh, no we're into the shapes now. I'm just like trying to pull it all together. So there are three clouds around it. So the shape of this one is trigonal planar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Kevin, the oxygen, the oxygen that's on the horizontal axis here. How many things are around that oxygen? Four. So that dictates the electronic shape to be? Tetrahedral. So if two of the things around that center atom are lone pairs, what does that make the molecular shape? Linear? 
I didn't hear you, Kevin. I said linear, but I feel like I'm no. wrong. No. Somebody help them. Oh, is that the this, this, that square pyramid? No. No. I don't know. If you have four things around the center of atom, two of them are lone pairs. What's the molecular shape, guys? Oh, it's bent. It's Thank bent. you. Thank you, Kevin. You solved your own problem. So we have the shape around this one is tetrahedron. The shape around this carbon is trigonal planar. The shape around this oxygen is bent. So when you have different things within a larger molecule, the shapes could be different. All right, we got to get through polarity. Remember, we talked a couple weeks ago about polar bonds. What makes a polar bond? Come on. Did I say something about electronegativities, guys? We watched a dog movie. One has more than the other. And what does that make the charge of the one that has more electronegativity? Negative. It makes it negative. So in order to have a polar bond, there has to be a difference in electronegativities and the electron spends more time around one than around the other. Okay? So polarity is a property of a molecule when placed into a magnetic field will orient towards that magnetic field. In other words, if you have a molecule with a negative side and a positive side, and you have a molecular field, positive, negative, that molecule will move such that it will orient the negative portion of the molecule to the positive field of the magnet. A lot of properties devolve from polarity. Probably the single most important is solubility, because if you have a polar molecule, then water, which is polar itself, can surround that polar molecule, aligning all the charges together and make it dissolve. If you have a nonpolar solvent like gasoline and you have a polar compound like sugar, they don't mix. So sugar will not dissolve in gasoline. I've been through this. Yep, 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 yep. Now, back in medieval times, they had this quaint little custom called drawing and quartering. And basically what they would do is they would tie a person's limbs to each one of four horses and yell giddy up. Now, if each of the forces, if each of the horses are pulling with the same amount of force, is the torso going to move? No. If you don't like that analogy, let's think about a tug of war. If you have a 200 pound man on one end of the tug of war and a 200 man pound man on the other end, and they start pulling, is the center of the rope going to really move? So polarity, in other words, this orientation within a magnetic field has to do with two things. You have to have polar bonds. If you don't have polar bonds, there can be no polarity of the molecule. The second thing you have to have is you have to have asymmetry. If everything is equal, if every molecule is pulling away from the center atom with the same force, then you are not going to have polarity. So you need two things to have a polar molecule. One, polar bonds. Two, asymmetry. So let's think about, let's think about carbon dioxide, okay? Oxygen and carbon has a polar bond. Oxygen is much more electronegative than carbon is. So there's an overall negative charge on this oxygen. 
there's the same amount of negative charge on this oxygen. So they're pulling away from one another with equal and opposite forces. If that's the case, then there is no polarity. Carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. If you want to think about it in another way, this is a linear molecule. This side is negative, this side is negative. If you put that into a magnetic field with a positive and negative, this one is going to try to go to the positive, but it's going to be repulsed by this side. So the molecule is going to stay in the molecular field straight. So you need to have asymmetry and you need to have a polar, polar bond. Let's look about water, okay? You also need to understand about vectors when we're dealing with polarity, okay? Now, if I have an oxygen with two hydrogens, the electrons, are gonna spend more time around the oxygen than the two hydrogens. So that's gonna make the oxygen negative and the hydrogens positive, all right? There's an overall positive force which is going down and to the right for this hydrogen and overall positive force down and to the left for this hydrogen. Vector-wise, they even out. It's kind of like if you have Okay, 200 pound men pulling in this direction and equally in opposite, a 200 pound man pushing in that direction. Because these guys are pulling this way, they have an overall force going straight back. And that is offset by the oxygen, by the other atom pulling directly in an opposite fashion. So let's look at some. Uh, in, I have HCl. Why is that molecule polar? Cl has more electrons. And is it symmetrical? Yes. Is it? The atoms aren't. No, my bad. Okay. This side has chlorine. This side has hydrogen. It is not symmetrical, all right? On the other hand, Ian, is there a polar bond between carbon and chlorine? No. There's no polar bond between carbon and Wait, chlorine? No, there is, but they're symmetrical this time. These, each one of these chlorines are pulling in an equal and opposite direction. The overall molecule is, is symmetrical. So if the overall molecule is symmetrical, even though we have polar bonds, carbon tetrachloride, which is this molecule, is not polar. Kevin. Yes. Let's look at this guy. Why is ammonia polar? Uh, because it's symmetrical. Is it symmetrical? I the bottom so. half of this, right, Kevin, look, the bottom half of this has three hydrogens coming off of it. In yeah. order for this to be symmetrical, wouldn't there have to be three hydrogens coming off the top? Well, they're all evenly spaced. They're all evenly spaced, but, Kevin, this side of the molecule just has that electron cloud in it. Okay. So you need to see what makes this symmetrical? In order for this to be symmetrical, I have to have my left and my right hand like this. Does that make sense, Kevin? Yeah, I see. If what I take you're away saying. my right hand, is this symmetrical anymore? Negative. So look at this. I have my three hydrogens on top of the nitrogen, three hydrogens on the bottom. That would be symmetrical. I take away the three hydrogens on top. That makes this molecule asymmetrical. It has polar bonds. It has asymmetry. It is polar. Okay, Kevin? 
Okay. Gabe. Yeah. How about uh, chloromethane? Does this have polar bonds in it? Yes. Yep, because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. All right? Mm -hmm. So it, has, it satisfies the first rule. How about the second? Is this symmetrical? No. No. So it is asymmetrical, has polar bonds. It's going to be polar. Polar. OK, Jessica. Jessica? Jessica. OK, Jasmina. Yes. How about this guy? Why is this one nonpolar? It has polar bonds. Why is it nonpolar? Uh, is it because the boron isn't filled? No, the bonds are full. What, just a minute. What are the two requirements for polarity? Symmetrical, and I forget the other one. Asymmetrical, not symmetrical, asymmetrical. Oh. If, if it's asymmetrical and it has polar bonds, then it is polar. Asymmetry, polar bonds, polar molecule. Does this have polar bonds, Jasmina? Yes, no. It has polar bonds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Satisfies the first requirement. Is it asymmetrical? No. So therefore, it can't be polar. How about SO2? Polar or not? Polar. Why? Because it's asymmetrical. Yeah, it is. Remember, Kevin? That cloud on the S. You got a cloud, so this is bent. The molecule's bent. So, what's the other requirement, Kevin? Oh. Uh, asymmetrical and. Dang it, you just said it. I forget again. <laughs> Somebody help them. Asymm asymmetry and what? The charges, the electro, the charges can't match. The electronegativities. Oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. Has to have polar bonds. Has to be asymmetrical. Ian, how about sulfur, uh, sulfur hexafluoride, Ian? Polar. Polar uh, bonds. Yes. Is it symmetrical? Um, yes. If it's symmetrical, can it ever be polar? No. Is that molecule polar or not? Nonpolar. Nonpolar. Okay. So summary of what we've done uh, crap go slideshow maybe that'll do better okay so the summary for dealing with vesper you gotta draw the lewis dot structure have to have to have to have to then you predict using the electron clouds, you're going to predict the geometry around the center atom. Use that chart I have. Then you kind of have to subtract out the lone pairs. 
to determine whether the geometric and molecular shape are the same. To determine polarity, you have to first determine whether there are polar bonds. And second, if there are polar bonds, you have to determine whether the molecule is asymmetrical. Asymmetry and polar bonds. Molecule will be polar. All right. We have a great little theory called quantum mechanics. Trouble is, there are some problems with it. For one thing, we just went through and talked about a whole bunch of bond angles, didn't we, guys? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you remember? Okay, S orbitals can be attacked from anywhere. But what about the P orbitals? Do you remember what quantum mechanics said about the P's? Remember they were set up along the X, Y, and Z axes? Right? Remember we said that about the P orbitals? And the D for that matter. They depend upon the axes to set them up. How far apart angle-wise is the X and Y, y angle? X and Y axes. What's the bond angle there? What's the angle between the X and the Y axis? 90 degrees. So if quantum mechanics held true 100%, then since quantum mechanics says that all of these are on 90 degree angles, wouldn't the bond angles also have to be 90 degrees? Somebody say yes. Come on, guys. Wouldn't they have yeah. to be 90 degrees? Thank yeah. you. Common sense dictates this isn't true. And if it wasn't common sense, practical experiments show that the bond angles are not 90 degrees. So we got to change the theory. OK, this is an orbital diagram of carbon. Kevin, how many unpaired electrons does carbon have? Two. So if it only has two unpaired electrons, how many things should be able to be bonded to carbon? Two. Two. How many have you seen carbon bond to? Remember we did CH4? In CH4, how many things are bonded to carbon? So, atomic theory, our quantum mechanics says only two things can bond to carbon, yet we know four things can bond to carbon. The other thing, okay, if I draw, I hope it's here, it's not, damn it. If I draw an orbital diagram, a beryllium, beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. Nothing should be able to bond to, for, to beryllium because it has no unpaired electrons. So we got to futz with the theory. When the theory doesn't add up, you modify it. Scientific method. Columbus didn't believe the earth was flat. So he went out to prove it. Ultimately, he did get credit for it. So what we're gonna do, guys, we are going to deal with a hybrid situation. A hybrid is when you mix two things together and you get something else out of it. You mix a tangerine and an orange, you get a tangelo. You mix a mule with a, I'm sorry, excuse me, you mix a horse with a donkey, you get a mule. Cars even work as working with electricity and gasoline. So we're going to take what we have. We're going to take the orbitals we have, and we are going to hybridize them. So because we know that different shapes have to happen, what we're going to theorize is that 
The orbitals, when they're dealing with bonding, don't exist as atomic orbitals. We're going to say we are going to hybridize those atomic orbitals so that we can get the shapes that we need. So if I have a hydrogen and a chlorine, in order to get them to bond the areas of overlap, between the electron of the hydrogen and the electron of the chlorine have to overlap in order for theirs to be, there to be a bond. So when atoms, atoms share electrons when they overlap. So we can have an S and an S and have an overlap. We can have a P and a P. If the orbital from one atom approaches the other, we have a bond where the electrons overlap. We can do this with p orbitals. We have a bond where the electrons overlap. We can actually even have an s and one p do that. The increased overlap brings the electron and the nucleus together. So as we are getting bonding, the nucleuses are together and we're decreasing electron-electron repulsion. So the energy level is down. As we get further away, we get more and more of that ele electron repulsion. So we get more and more, uh, less and less energy. Also, if we get them too close, we have the problem with the nucleuses repelling one another. So I have two fluorines. They can attack each other straight on because each one of them has one of its p orbitals that's unfilled. So they can attack straight on and we can have a linear molecule. But we have BEF2. We know experimentally we can determine that BEF2 exists. We have to get two unpaired electrons on beryllium in order for this to happen. So this is beryllium's atomic, uh, this is a to, uh, its orbital diagram. You notice no unpaired electrons. Riddle me this, Batman. If I promote if I promote one of these electrons to the P, how many unpaired electrons would I have? Two. Two, which would account for the two bonds to beryllium. So I'm going to promote one. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this electron and promote it. But we still don't have the bond angles right. We're still dealing with 90 degree bond angles. What happens, what happens if we mix the S and a P and make a hybrid orbital of it? So we no longer have an S orbital and a P orbital. We have two SP orbitals. So we can mix the two orbitals together and we get an overall shape for each one that looks like this, where each SP looks like a bigger P. So we're gonna take our S and P, hybridize them, and we're gonna end up with something that looks like this. Now, what happens is these electron clouds are bigger than they were before. So they're gonna to have to push away from one another. If there are just one thing attached to them, then we're gonna stay in our SP hybridization and they're gonna be 180 degrees away from one another. And this is consistent with what we see with beryllium. So if I'm going to draw 
if I'm going to draw this, remember, I took one S orbital, I took one P. If I hybridize them, then this new orbital is gonna take some of the characteristics of the original orbitals, including the energy. So my SP is gonna be higher than the two S was, but lower than the two P. You have to remember, when I did this hybridization, I only took one P orbital. There are still two P orbitals out there free. Keep that in mind, we're gonna need that in the future. So we have a series of hybridized orbitals. Each of them accommodates an electron domain and a shape. If I mix one S and one P, that's called an SP orbital. My geometry is going to be linear. If I mix one S and two P's, that is going to be an SP2. Note how we designate it. Small s, small p, superscript two. That's how sp2 is dictated. sp2, trigonal planar geometry. I take a third p orbital out of there. I make an sp3. That means my shape is going to be tetrahedron. Now, do I have any more p orbitals? How many p orbitals are there on any one level? Come on guys, how many p orbitals are there in any, any shell? How many p suborbitals are there? X, Y, Z? Is anybody out there? Yeah. And would it be three? Three. No what. All right, three. So I've just used my S and my three P's. Do I have any more P orbitals left, Ian? No. So I have to grab them from the D. The next one, when I have five things around that center atom, my hybridization is going to be SP3D. And that's going to dictate a trigonal bipyramid geometry. I have six things around. I got to grab another D orbital, SP3, SP3D2. Guys, I know you're kind of, fuzzy on this, but let's look at the bottom line here. All right, bottom line, I have two electron clouds. The number of electron clouds will dictate the hybridization. If I have two electron clouds around my center atom, then my center atom has to, has to, has to be hybridized SP and the shape is going to be linear. I have three electron clouds around my center atom. Hybridization, I need three orbitals, an S and two Ps. So the hybridization becomes sp2, shape is trigonal planar. Four things around the center atom, four clouds around the center atom, I need four hybridized orbitals, sppp, sp3. Five things around the center atom, I need five hybridized orbitals. S, P, 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 D, S, P, 3, D. Six things around, I need six hybridized orbitals. S, P, 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 D, D, S, P, 3, D, 2. So if you count the electron clouds, you automatically know what the hybridization is. 
Is that sinking in, guys? Yes. So I have NH3. NH3 has three bonds. Each of the hydrogens is bonded to the nitrogen. So those are three clouds. I have a lone pair. How many clouds do I have around the center atom? Four. Four, okay. So how many hybridized orbitals do I need to accommodate that? Four. SP3, SPPP, SP3. I have to hybridize the S with three of the Ps. And then that will dictate a tetrahedral geometry. Important, when we mix N atomic orbitals, in other words, what this slide is saying, the number of atomic orbitals that we hybridize must equal the number of hybrid orbitals. So if I have an S and two Ps, that means I have three sp2 orbitals. Therefore, I have one unhybridized p orbital remaining. And sp2, the large lobes, when I put three of them around the center atom, they push away from each other such that they lie in a trigonal planar fashion. Every molecule that has a trigonal planar geometry has sp2 hybridization. So, if I have boron, the atomic diagram of boron is this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to promote an electron, which gives me these orbitals. I then hybridize them. These two with the electrons get hybridized with this S to make three sp2 orbitals. I still have one 2p orbital free. If I put these three guys together, I make three orbitals like this. When I put them all together and hybridize them, I get a trigonal planar geometry. With carbon, I promote the electron, get an electron in each of the S and the two Ps. This means I have four sp3 hybridized orbitals. When I shove all of those together, the geometry I end up with is tetrahedron. And this is nothing more than what I've just said. So if I'm dealing with five things around the center atom, I have to employ a D orbital. So the hybridization for five things around it is sp3D. If I have an octahedron, that's gonna involve two D orbitals. Now, if I'm dealing with sp3D2 hybridization, that leaves me three D orbitals that are not hybridized. So if I'm dealing with something with five electrons, I can promote this up to the D level and make five sp3 Ds. That leads to a trigonal bipyramid. If I have six degenerative orbitals, that leads to an octahedron shape. 
All right, to determine the hybridization. This is easy, guys. This is, this is probably gonna be the easiest questions you have. All you gotta do, draw the Lewis structure, count the electron domains. That's the number of hybrid orbitals necessary to account for that molecule's geometry. So if I have three electron clouds around the center atom, that means I have sp2 hybridization. There are three of those hybrid orbitals. If I have PCL5, five things around the center atom, I have to promote one of the S electrons to the D. So I have five orbitals. This is gonna involve five sp3d hybrid orbitals. Bear in mind, we have unhybridized orbitals as well. All right. NCL3. Hey, Professor. Yes. I'm sorry. I got to go for my math class, but. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll watch the video after when it's posted. Okay. What I'm going to do is this is where I, it's time ending anyway, Gabe. So this is where I'm going to end the, the talk right now. Okay. Yes, I realize this is mind blowing, but it's, you got to understand it's simpler than you are making it out to be. Bottom line, however many electron clouds you have, that dictates how many hybrid orbitals you need. And then just start counting. S, add the P's first, then add D's. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? No, not from me. No, I understand it. Thank you, Professor. No problem. Jasmina, Jessica, Kevin. Have a good weekend. I'm sorry, Kevin. Have a good weekend. You have a good weekend. Do you understand this stuff? Is it coming a little bit? Yeah, I pretty much understand it. I'm just going to go over it again. OK. Please, avail yourself of the videos if necessary. Jessica, you still here? Jessica's gone. Jasmine, Ian, that's all I, I have. All Jessica, right. You guys understanding this really? Yeah, yeah it's pretty for, easy. Yeah. The trouble is you can't overthink it. You, you just can't overthink it at this point. Make it as simple as possible for you, for yourselves by just realizing that the electron clouds dictate how many hybrid orbitals you have. All right, I'll probably join the Zoom call at 5.30 then though. Okay, good enough. So I'll see you later. See you later, Ian. Jasmina, take care, have a nice weekend. You too.